there's any sort. Uh, you are interested. I'm interested. Okay, great. Sort. <laughs> <laughs> I've known George for quite a number of years. Um, George and I first met, um, I don't remember the year, but when we were studying for the CBT exam at the same time. Like he and I both took the exam at the same time, but he was a little more crazy than I was, and he also took the CCS exam at the same time. I was not that crazy. I did not endeavor to do that. Uh, he passed both, which was quite amazing, quite an accomplishment. A few years later, George and I worked together and uh, we revamped uh, Division 7 section um, penetration fire stopping together. And with that effort, we were both awarded uh, fire stop, our fire marshal educator of the year awards, which was quite an accomplishment. It was very nice, very nice to receive from the fire marshal association of St. Louis. Um, throughout that time, though, George and I become good friends and George uh, and I hang out quite a bit uh, at the Scottish Arms, which we'll probably do afterwards if you would like to attend. Um, trade Scotch recipes and uh, flavors and whatnot. Um, but one of the things George and I always talk about, and somebody else we do as well, uh, is ethics. And ethics and architecture is something that we seem, we seem to have forgotten. It's a forgotten component of what we do. And it's a very important component. And last year in Duluth, a lot of states require, we didn't realize this, but a lot of states require uh, ethics as part of your re-registration. And George has given a presentation similar to this in Springfield, Missouri. Um, and he's expanded on that a little bit. And I unfortunately did not attend in Construct because I knew you were doing it here. And it was something else I wanted to say in Construct. Um, but uh, without further ado, George is going to talk to us about ethics. So George. Well, thank you, Michael and Steve, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, I did this in a 60-minute version the last time, and for vague questions. Uh, since we have 90 minutes, you may ask questions, but only if your head is going to explode if you don't ask it. <laughs> Um, and uh, we understand that Jane Powell, who is a uh, former member of our chapter, is monitoring this. So, Jane, if you get any questions on Facebook, uh, please pass them on. Um, so why the subtitle, Making Good Choices? Uh, actually, this goes back to something my daughter said when our grandsons uh, entered their teen years and they would... Uh, whenever grandma and grandpa came over, they would leave on a Friday night or, or Saturday night to do more fun stuff. And as they were leaving, our daughter would say, good night, boys, have fun, make good choices. Well, to, to me, that meant three things. It meant that they have, uh, that my, my daughter and son-in-law have raised fundamentally good young men, that they knew right from wrong. The second thing is that they knew the rules of the society that they lived in and what actions they could and could not take within those rules. And third, and maybe most importantly, they understood that the actions that they took had consequences and that they were responsible for the consequences of the actions that they took. Um, we are getting AIA credit for this. and. Maureen or Linda or someone has the signing sheet if you haven't signed in, uh, we will take care of that. Um, so this, this class, each of us probably thinks we know what ethics is. We probably have our own sort of uh, internal view. But if we polled this group, we probably wouldn't come up with the, with the same thing. And the reason is that we get conflicting guidance on what ethics is from groups that we belong to, from the church that we go to maybe, from reading about politics, right? Um, this is not a typical seminar on ethics that you may have been to before where the presentation is, if A happens, you should do B. If C happens, you should do D. 
Rather, it's going to be an exploration of the source of professional ethics and the standards that we use to determine the choices that we make. And I think uh, the AIA probably uh, ethically requires that I read these. I, I normally don't, but I will. Um, learning objectives differentiate between ethics and the rules of conduct. Describe and clearly articulate ethical issues in design and construction practice. Identify ethical dilemmas and formulate an effective process for dealing with them. And finally, uh, evaluate the ethical factors that influence a professional's decision-making process. Sounds like a spec writer wrote those, right? Yeah, maybe. As usual with our CSI chapter here, the Wham-O Saco introduction will have you standing and cheering and stomping your feet. And the conclusion will have you rolling on the floor in tears or laughter. But in between, we're going to talk a bit about the history of ethics, look at some codes of ethics, uh, two uh, examples, and then a case study. So um, what is ethics? Well, ethics is bound up with morals, but ethics and morals are not really the same thing. Ethics is informed by things like laws, and customs and the rules that we practice. We may want ethics to be solid and constant. We may want them to be our rock, you know, something that's always there. We may also want to rely on one single ethical pr principle that we can use for everything that we need to look at. But is this a real viewpoint. What sort of things influence your ethics? Where do your ethics come from? And because uh, I see uh, many talented spec writers in the room, um, what is ethics? What are ethics? The singular ethics is, is generally used for the field of study or when you're referring to a specific code of ethics and the plural ethics are is generally for your personal standards or when referring to multiple items within a code of ethics. And uh, since I'm a better writer than speaker, I usually get this right when I write it, but uh, we'll have to see if I carry this through in the talk. Uh, the Venn diagram here looks at three domains that have developed over time. And they each give order to how we relate to and live with uh, each, each other within this, this world. Laws are prohibited things. Laws are the must-nots. Customs are suggested things. They're the shoulds. And morals, depending on how strong your moral code is, right? are either must-nots or should-nots. So in the CSI world, we, we really, you know, we like to really put things in, in order and give you rules and so forth. And we really want ethics to be right in the center of this Venn diagram, you know, don't we? We, we really want to say that ethics is the merging of all three, three of these, these things. And often this is true, but many times it is not true. So um, let's look at one thing that's pretty simple, and uh, I'm going to ask you where it came from, which of these three do domains did, did this start in, and that is driving on the right side of the, of the road. Where, where did that start? What, what domain does that really live in? Laws. Laws. Wrong. Customs. Customs, right, because when it started, it was, you know, horse and buggy, and we were going down a, a path, and we had to uh, d develop a custom for me to go right and you, you to go left. And the reason we know it started with custom is there are vast parts of the world where they drive on the other side. The custom developed, you know, the, the other way. So <laughs> as we got to a faster-paced world, it went into the realm of laws. So it was customs and laws. And now it's probably in all three, because if you drive that school bus full of kids on the wrong side of the road, that's a moral failure. So that may be something that's right in the, in the, you know, the middle there. But let's look at something that really doesn't fall in all three. 
Henry David Thoreau in the 1840s urged us not to pay taxes to support an unjust war. Civil Disobedience is the name of the book and the concept. And you see the same technique used by Gandhi and Rosa Parks and Nelson Mandela uh, and Martin Luther King. And what does, what do King and Parks and Mandela and Henry David Thoreau, what do they all have in common? They all went to jail because of what they did, right? So when you take that moral stand outside of the law, the consequences of your act is punishment, right? And each of these things, when you, you go outside the circle, has a different punishment. If you uh, violate the rules of your church, you're kicked out of the church, you're condemned to hell maybe, right? Uh, if you show up at the formal dinner wearing a t-shirt and you use the wrong fork and you put your feet on the table, you're likely not getting asked back, right? You're being ostracized. So each of these things has a slightly different slant to it. Ethics has three main branches. At the top level is meta-ethics. Meta-ethics looks at the basic meaning of ethical terms, the fundamental nature of judgments, and how we support those judgments. It asks questions like, what is good? What is bad? How can we tell good from bad, right? Uh, Plato, in one of the Socratic di dialogues, asks this quintessential um, meta-ethical question, even though the term meta-ethics wasn't invented for like another thousand years or so. But Plato asked, is an action good because God commands it? Or does God command an action because it is good? Wrap your hands around that. That's a significantly different starting point. Applied ethics, on the other hand, is probably what the typical professional ethics uh, class is, right? It, it, it looks at, is action X moral? And if it is not, how do you make it moral, right? Uh, if you take a seminar on state licensure or on the AIA code of ethics, or if you're in a corporation and you're mandated to go to one of those corporate ethics classes, that's all applied ethics. Um, so I'll touch a bit on meta-ethics and applied ethics, but today we're going to live in the world of normative ethics. Um, what standards do I use for determining a good choice? And where do those standards come from? I think normative ethics are the heart of ethics theory. And a great example of a normative of a normative ethics principle is the golden rule. We should treat others the way we want to be treated. And the reason this is a great normative ethical principle is it's fundamental, it's simple, and if you buy into it, at least in theory, you can use it to make any ethical judgment that comes down the, down the road. So uh, let's do a definition of what ethics is. And I want to present three different, um, three different de definitions that actually I, I wrote. So uh, you can judge them as good writing or, or not. But as I put them up, I want to ask you for a show of hands. If one of these appeals to you, if you say, yeah, I can buy into that, I think this is a good statement to find out if it's, raise your hand. You can raise your hand one time or three times or not at all. It really doesn't matter. So an ethical person puts into practice moral virtues that have been acquired over time through experience, habit, and self-discipline. It's really inside you. It's the person you are. Who thinks this is pretty much on the mark? A couple people, maybe half the room? Okay. 
An ethical person complies with universally accepted and established moral duties and rules that all are obliged to, to follow. It's about what you do, it's the actions you take. Well, Linda has her hand up already. That's okay. And anyone else think this is, you're, you're not wrong. Michael's half and half. Yeah, we've got maybe four, four or five people. Huh? Well, you can, you can raise your hand more, more than once. Ron, you were not want to. <laughs> you said you can't make me. <laughs> uh, next time we'll see. Okay, so uh, the third one, <laughs> the third one is an ethical person acts in a way to maximize positive and minimize negative results for the greatest benefit of so society. This is it's about the results of your your actions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, take a look at these because I want to clear the board and we're going to go through them one more time. And this time you must choose one. If you didn't choose, you have to this time. Okay, Ron, do, do your best, right? And if you chose all three, you have to settle on, on one. This is the multiple choice test, right? Okay, an ethical person puts into practice moral virtues that have been acquired over time and through experience, habit, and self-discipline. Who's in this camp? You people? Okay, remember you can't change. This is the one that you're buying into. You are practicing virtue ethics. Wait, maybe. I'm, I'm just being tough, you know, this is... Okay, an ethical person complies with universally accepted and established moral duties and rules that all are obliged to follow. Ooh, and this changed your mind. Okay, so we've got... Well, you can't. No, that's fine. I mean, that, uh, I'm not going to, you know, cause a fight between Linda and, and Ron. That's a bad thing. Okay, so if you if you chose this one, you are practicing deontology, duty-based ethics. And the final one is an ethical person acts in a way to maximize positive and minimize negative results for the greatest benefit of so society. So, who's into this one? Okay, you are practicing consequentialism or utilitarianism. And this was very gratifying because in Long Beach, uh, there were far, far fewer people on the middle one. And I don't know if that's because I wrote it badly or that's just the way people break down. We were relatively closely done. Uh, the middle one was not quite uh, up to the other two. But uh, virtue ethics, deontology, consequentialism are the three major theories in play today in normative ethics. The me, nor, normative, the, the middle one, the one I highlighted in, in red. The basic sort of standards that we, we look at when we decide to be ethical and how we should do it. So virtue ethics, deontology, consequentialism. And we'll look at this through the light of history. And once again, George will do a whirlwind tour of history like he's prone to do, but does anyone know what I'm, I'm showing here, this, this object? Code of Hammurabi. Code of Hammurabi, okay. Yeah. Hmm? Yes, you're absolutely right. And the reason we know this as architects is because we've probably been in a seminar where this has been defined as the first building code or the first law or whatever. Um, it's the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, the law of retaliation, let's tell, tell you on this. Um, it's revolutionary because it introduces early attempts at a building code, contract law, contract rights, and responsibilities. To those of us who grew up in the Western and Christian worlds, and particularly those of us who may have been taught by nuns, um, an eye for an eye is kind of frowned upon. It, it was the pagan rule. It was the old-fashioned way of doing things. It was superseded by what? The golden rule, right? The golden rule was Christian. It was better. But Les Talionis and the Code of Hammurabi was important because it set limits on punishment, right? We're all familiar with the man buildeth a, a house and the house fall down and kills the, the owner, the builder, shall be put to, to death, right? That was the cruel part of it. But here's what it meant. It meant that the Babylonian me couldn't creep into your compound after dark and slaughter your entire family because your cousin killed my goat. Right? As much as I love that goat, there's no balance there. And, and 
that's the important thing about laws and about ethics, is there is a fairness. And this all goes back to 2,000 years BC. Um, also interesting, before I get off the slide, is look how this was given. This was a divinely given law. Those of you who sorted yourself into virtue ethics when we went through it in our ethical Hogwarts, then Aristotle is your house founder. To Ar Aristotle, virtues are tangible, they're real. You know, you have a heart, you have lungs, and you have virtue. It's a real thing. It's fundamental to your citizenship, to how you relate to the world, and to politics. And Aristotle, virtues are not a superlative trait. <clears throat> Courage is not the best on a scale. Courage, for example, is a means, a moderation between the extreme of cowardice on the one side and rashness on the other. And that's what they were looking at. They were looking at this sort of middle road of virtue. Instead of being about conduct or character, I'm sorry, instead of being about conduct or consequences, it's about character. Virtue is acquired over time by acquiring knowledge and good habits and self-discipline. And to the Greeks, the ultimate goal was this word eudaimonia. EU part is from good, euphoria, and a bunch of other words you can think of. And di daimon is actually a spirit or genius, or also evil. It can mean you know all, all sorts of things. But your your ultimate goal was essentially doing the right thing because you're the right type of person. The early Christians for about a thousand years dealt with a couple of important issues. Both St. Augustine of Hippo and St. Thomas uh, Aquinas dealt with these. The first one is, how do we Christians incorporate and reconcile Greek and also Roman and also Jewish values into Christian dogma? And this includes virtue. Uh, ethics. How, how does this all kind of get, get melted, melted in? So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, what is the appropriate relationship between church and state? In St. Augustine's City of God, which is one of his great works, he differentiates between what he calls the city of man and the spiritual city of God. And he does... Uh, suggests that there is some interconnectedness between them, but each has its own function and focus. So he's really relatively separate. God is the grantor of salvation, the entrance ticket to the city of God. Being a predestinationist, God knows the destinies, right? Thomas Aquinas comes along 800 years later, and we often conflate these two as being of the same, same time frame. You know, one is at the beginning, the other is at the, at the end. And Aquinas comes along at a time where Greek writings are being rediscovered and the Greek world is being re renewed. It's also a time where the Arab world is doing incredible science and math. And um, he looks around himself and he says, there's all this great stuff going on why is it that only Christians can get into heaven, basically? And he kind of um, looks past the divine command theory, that is that God commands what's morally right and forbids what's morally wrong, and he comes up with this natural law theory. And what natural law says is that God preloads the natural world with features that allow us to know evil from good. And that if we use God's greatest gift, our free will and our intellect, 
we can thrive. We can thrive in um, St. Augustine, City of Man, by, by learning and uh, inventing things, and we can thrive in the City of God by getting into heaven. So he has united the secular world and the spiritual world, and he's also opened it up to anyone with free will. The other thing he's done is he's taken normative ethics off of the shoulders of God, and he's put it on our shoulders. If we have free will, according to Aquinas, then it's up to us to figure it out. So, along comes this fellow. Machiavelli, do the ends justify the means? If you were following me on Twitter uh, this past week or so, I've been asking this, this question. Uh, this is the quote that comes closest to uh, do the ends justify the, the means. And Machiavelli is really introducing consequentialism, even though that term doesn't get invented for two or three hundred years. In Machiavelli's great work, The Prince, which is really a, uh, it's a handbook for governing an uh, Italian city-state. He asked the question, is it better for a prince to be loved or to be feared? And he answers it like this. He says, of course it's better that a prince can be both. He can both be loved and feared as the time is uh, appropriate. But if you have to choose, it's better for a prince to be feared. And the reason he does this is because he recognizes that in our city-state, what do we want? We want a prince who can further our goals, protect us with military against neighboring city-states when they uh, invade us, build our wealth, build our culture. That's what a prince ought to do. And to Machiavelli, it really doesn't matter whether the prince is a good person or moral or whatever, as long as the ends are there. So he takes politics out, completely out, of the historic realm of religious morals. So how did, does the church view the consequentialism of Machiavelli? If you recall from the previous slide, I talked about St. Augustine, St. Thomas uh, Aquinas, they were great saints in the Christian church. You don't see a saint here, right? Enough said about how the church treats Machiavelli. You can't come to one of these talks that I give without me talking about William Shakespeare because I like the guy. Henry V is a play about war and fighting and a, a really active play, but it's also a play about ethics and deontology and duty. And I've chosen a very uh, calm scene from the play here. It's the night before the Battle of Agincourt, which is a major battle in history and also the, the climax of the, of the play. And King Henry uh, is not sleeping. No one is, is sleeping. You know, the soldiers are all tense and ready for, for the battle. And uh, King Henry uh, puts a uh, disguise on and he goes out to sense the mood of his, his soldiers. And he comes upon a scene at a campfire where a debate is going on about is war just? Not only is all war just, but specifically is this war that we're in now just? And the soldier says, now if these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the king that led them into it. Not dying well doesn't mean that they died or didn't die bravely. What it means is they died with mortal sin on their souls. And knowing Shakespeare, the reason they had mortal sin on their souls was they were drinking and whoring and having a good time the night before and didn't get to the priest, right? So the soldier's saying that if the war is not just, if the king led us into something that isn't just, Somehow our sins transferred to, to the king. And Henry says, every subject's duty is the king, but every subject's soul is his own. Just because the king or your government or the corporation that you work for commands you to do something 
it doesn't excuse you from not being ethical. Ultimately, your ethics are your, your own, and you have your own free will, right, which we just talked about, um, to, to make your own choices. So the thread of personal responsibility is strong in this whole thing. I'm done with Shakespeare for all of you that found him boring in high school. <laughs> but we all know Adam Smith, right? Father of economics, uh, explainer of, of markets. He was an ethicist. Ethicist. His title was Professor of Moral Phil Philosophy at, at Oxford. Um, I include the whole title of his book, uh, The Wealth of Nations, just to show that the idea of markets and his whole theory didn't spring magically from his head. He did a lot of research and a lot of thinking about the way things work. Wealth of Nations is not just a book devoted to markets because in it, Adam Smith actually identifies and in some cases suggests ways to solve five or six problems that are caused by and I'm going to use the word capitalism here. That word wasn't invented until later, but that's ultimately what um, his work led to. And if we could summarize those six things into one statement, it would be this. Is capitalism's capacity to create enormous wealth and to greatly reduce poverty somehow offset by a reduction in the moral quality of the people who are either the capitalists or the or the workers? And that's a tough question. I mean, that's a question that we've been grappling with in economics ever since Adam Smith. Adam Smith in this book is not just inventing economics, he's inventing business ethics. Today, when we, we take classes in business ethics, they often focus on issues like liability or risk. They're given to protect the cor corporation, the company that you, that you work for. Generally, that protects you also, but there often comes a time where your interests and the companies um, are not the same. And so Smith's ethics deal with broader issues of benefits and negative impacts on everyone. So we're in the 1800s now. Two Enlightenment thinkers are each looking for a rational basis for legal, social, and moral reform, and they end up in vastly different places. In Immanuel Kant, uh, who is, is German, and actually uh, they were fairly close in time. He's probably about 25 years older than, than uh, Jeremy Bentham. But he is the father of deontology duty-based ethics. And he comes up with a categor categorical Im imperative. It's a big, long discussion to figure out what this is, but to summarize it in one sentence, the categorical imperative is a universal ethical principle. Always respect humanity and others, and only act in accordance with rules that could hold for everyone. A lot of what I'm presenting here may imply that deontology, that duty-based ethics, is written and rule-based. But for Kant, he was starting fresh. There weren't written rules. His deontology sprang from a ra rational pr process, and here's what he did. He hypothesized an action, followed it to its logical ends, universalized it to see if it would work for everyone. And if it's good for others, it must be good for everyone else, including you. So, is lying wrong? Well, the way you figure this out is you hypothesize a world in which, in which everyone always lies. Not today's world where some people lie, some people don't. It's a world where everyone always lies. So what does that mean? It means you can't lie. When Steve talks to me, I assume the opposite of what he says. And when I answer him, he assumes the opposite of what I said, because we're both lying and we both knew it. Logic fails, right? 
So to Kant, then, you shouldn't lie. That's a fundamental basic principle. And he does this with murder and stealing, you know, and all sorts, sorts of other things. Jeremy Bentham, who is from England and later Scotland, and his student John Stuart Mill, come up with this starting point. The greatest happiness of the greatest number is the measure of right and wrong. So does this mean that consequentialism is about making me happy? Is it about hedonism? Is it about my own personal self? Well, remember, it's the greatest overall happiness that he's talking about. It requires objective public discourse. You have to make decisions under this theory as if you are a disinterested a disinterested but benevolent spectator. We may sometimes think that ethics requires us to be very giving, to not make a lot of money, to be um, very generous. But there's nothing in any of these three ethical theories that says that we can't make a lot of money as a result of our ethical choices. What it does say is you can't make an ethical decision because you will end up making a lot of money, right? And there's a big difference there. If you put yourself last, if you take yourself out of it, and the decision happens to be to your benefit, you are being ethical. If you make a decision because you know that the results of that decision will make you a pile of money, you are being unethical. So, to sum it up, I see a lot of puzzled faces here. We'll do a chart. <laughs> These are the three theories in norm normative uh, ethics and, and this shows uh, the emphasis of each one. Virtue ethics emphasizes the person, the actor, the one who does the deed. Deontology, duty-based ethics, emphasizes the action. Right? The first says the person is the ethical thing. The second says that the action is the ethical thing. Consequentialism says that the result is the ethical thing. That's the emphasis. One of the points being made here, I think, is that none of them stands on its own. That you need to understand all of them and work your way through it, okay? I'm just cur curious, would, that would, would anyone change their, their choice based on what, what we've, we've been through? No, no, yep. But wouldn't there be one that has all three. I mean, the act, the action, and the result. That's what that's what ethical choices re really are. What, what I'm showing here is sort of the pure the theory, kind of you know behind it. But it's true. All of them have to like deal with all three. So being ethical, you're 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 I don't know how to how to say this. You're using all three. Right. And categories, I guess, are theories. And that's the point of what I'm getting at. Okay, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> See you're on. Okay, so so let's let's um, let's take a look at why these don't stand by themselves. Virtue ethics depends on time and place. We really don't want to be Greek virtue ethicists, because Greek virtue ethics allowed, and in fact, some would say demanded, slavery. Within the Greek virtue ethics rules, slavery was normal and justified, okay? Let's, let's take uh, another time and place. The mafia in Naples, the omerta, the rule of honor. You don't rat out your friends. You don't rat out the people that you're fighting with. You don't go to the police, right? That's the honor code in that group. Well, think about this. Those of you who grew up on the playground in the 50s, like some of us did, you didn't rat out your friends, right? 
you didn't tell on, on someone, regardless of what they did. To, to that, I think, has changed. We have honor codes now, and, and we probably are less prone to be doing that. Um, the deontology versus con consequentialism, and they kind of go head to head throughout this whole, whole thing, but um, here's a story that Kant told about deontology. And remember, he said that lying is forbidden. You must always tell the truth. So, so here's the story. A friend is over at, at your house, you're having a cup of tea or a, a glass of scotch, in, in our case, and uh, there's a knock at the door, a guy walks up and he says, is your friend with you? If he's there, I'm going to kill him. So what do you say? You say, yeah, sure, he's in, in the back room. Everyone, huh? well, yeah, no. <laughs> well, I, I would lie for you. Everyone in this room would probably lie, right? I mean, is there anyone who would tell the truth in that case? No one is that strict, right? Um, the co consequentialist says, yes, you know, that's what you need to be. You need to see the consequences of your lie. Kant has the answer for this in his theory. He says, okay, what if your friend heard you talking to the guy, he sneaks out the back door, you lie to the, the killer, he goes around the side yard, he hits the, the street just as the killer is leaving and your friend gets killed. Aren't you, Mr. Consequentialist or Ms. Consequentialist, responsible for the person's death? And that's the failure of consequentialism, is that you can't perfectly know the consequences. You can't know know the future. John Rawls and the Veil of Ignorance. It sounds like a Harry, Harry Potter book, right? It's a thought experiment that John Rawls um, came up with in the later part of the 1900s. And it goes like this. Picture yourself in an unborn state. You're about to be born into a world, and you have absolute control over what that world is going to be. You can set up the world however you want to, <coughs> but you have no control over who you are going to be. Your role in that world is totally random. And he asks the question, describe the world. How would you set this up? So if you default to the world as it is now, every one of us would think, well, we're going to be an oil, you know, wealthy sheep, right? We're going to have millions and millions of dollars. What are the odds of that happening versus the odds of being born uh, in a slave labor somewhere, right? And so Rawls is actually a deontologist who's trying to give us a duty-based system for coming up with a socially just world. He also, though, gives us a basis for being a good consequentialist because it takes ourselves out of the equation. If we can put aside our biases and everything that makes us us and look at what's going on, we're really putting ourselves last. You can never actually do that because we're all human beings, but that's the goal. And the other thing about this uh, thing uh, that Rawls does is that he uh, he says that we all end up as virtue et ethicists, right? That if we think in this manner, if we take ourselves out of it and look at the world, look at the company we're in, look at a contract we're about to sign or whatever, intuitively we know what is right and what is wrong. Okay, for you people that are grading your teeth saying, why doesn't he get to the, the real codes of ethics? We're going to breeze through some just so you feel good about it. <clears throat> Every one of us has ethics, regardless of the role that we have in construction or architecture or whatever, right? We all, each and every one of us, must follow the law. Why we say in our specs, why some of us insist on saying follow the code, I don't know, because the code is the law and we have to follow it. Those of us who are licensed, 
have licensure laws that we have to follow. And I'm sure everyone who is licensed has a hardbound copy of the standard of care by their, their desk. Okay, so someone explain why that's a that's a joke. I don't have a joke. <laughs> what? <laughs> what what did you say? I don't have a job. <laughs> yeah, you don't have a desk. <laughs> uh, for those of you who uh, aren't licensed and haven't been sued, the standard of care is uh, what the judge tells the jury when they uh, sit in judgment um, for the acts that you've committed as an architect or whatever. And the judge says, basically, judge this person based on the average comparable architect in the place where you, you live. There is no written standard of care. It's upon the jury to figure that out. Right? So that's something that we have to kind of deal with. Uh, AIA, CSI, and so forth all have their, their codes, and the employer's code of ethics. And um, as I mentioned before, maybe for 95 or 99 percent of the time, your employer's code of ethics can cover you but there will be times where your actions and your employers don't go hand in hand. So many of these codes, probably most of these codes, have an implicit bias by the people who wrote them. And that's not to say that they're bad. It's not to say that they don't cover most of what we do. It's not to say that, that when you have a, a class on, you know, uh, when A happens, you should do B, that that's bad. What it does say, is that ultimately it's up to you to kind of figure it out when you get into the tricky areas of the final five percent or so. Uh, we're going to look at the AIA Code of Ethics just because it's a good case study in how a lot of these codes of ethics are, are written. Um, there are canons that are the broad, broad sort of things we should think uh, about, uh, cl classify. There's currently, I think, six of them. Each canon has ethical standards and their goals that we need to follow. These are the shoulds. You should follow the ethical standard. The rules of conduct are the musts. If you violate the code of conduct, you can be disciplined by AIA. So um, this sort of a, a breakdown, the broad picture in canons, the goals and the ethical standards, and then the must sort of thing, the rules, kind of at the bottom. Um, AA was founded in 1857. We got our first code of ethics in 1909, which either means that architects were not ethical for 50 years or that we were so good that we didn't need one, right? But there was this gap before we really got our code of, uh, our code of ethics. And you can actually look this up. Uh, and get a copy of the 1909 code, um, it really emphasized how we learned gentlemen, and I say gentlemen because it was mostly white guys like me, right? How we learned gentlemen dealt with other learned gentlemen. You know, I couldn't take one of Fred's jobs. Steve couldn't take uh, one of my, my jobs. We, we had these rules of the game. There also was a fee structure. Any architects out there old enough to, to recall the fee, fee structure that was actually in place uh, when I got out, out of school? You, you recall that as well. It, it basically. I have a copy. Huh? I have a copy. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I should get it and put, put it up here because it, it's an actual thing. So, so uh, you know, the thing is to, to keep me from un, undercutting David, right? I, I, I couldn't charge less than what the fee <coughs> structure said. That was not ethical. And. Um, what happened in uh, the 1970s was that there were some lawsuits under the Sherman Antitrust Act that said this is restrained trade. And in fact, it, it was. Uh, it, it really didn't go to court. There were a couple of consent de decrees. So from, 1880 to, uh, from 1980 to 1986, uh, AIA looked at a revision to get rid of the uh, fee structure and to look at other things. Um, and they looked at various stakeholders, and that's how this five canons and then later six came, came into, into being. Um, if 
if at the beginning you thought ethics should be fixed over time, take a look at this, right? This is an ethical code that went through a lot of changes, and it's still being changed, because there's other things out there that are being kicked uh, around. In fact, it was just changed a month or so back where uh, diversity and equity were, were added to the, to the code. So um, here's kind of a recap of the uh, times and dates, and here are the six canons. Um, they are not hierarchical. In, in other words, if there's a conflict, number two doesn't um, override number five, and number three doesn't override number six. And this can cause some problems. Uh, many firms have uh, adopted the 2030 challenge or whatever for carbon neutral. Um, as long as you, as an architect, inform your client to the goals and get a buy-off from the client, you are being ethical. If you try to sneak in green uh, features without informing the client, you're not being ethical because you have a duty to the client to make sure that their budget is spent the way the client wants it. So, um, in general, I, I like the AIA Code of Ethics. I think it gives you a lot of good guidance, but there are pitfalls that if you don't um, diligently practice, you might fall, fall into. Um, just to look at some of the others, the NCARB uh, actually um, is more about the state life licensure laws. Um, it's interesting that the, the first AIA codes were adopted by law by the states. So there really was just that one code. Even if you weren't an AIA member, you were bound because you were licensed, right? Well, now NCARB has kind of taken over that uh, part of it, uh, and AIA is kind of standing on its, on its own. Uh, although there, there is uh, like a lot of overlap. I, I don't want to make it sound like there's a lot of difference between them. Uh, construction man management, uh, interesting that they have basically the same thing that the ar architects do. Uh, they don't have a general ob obligations, which is our first one, and they don't have obligation to co colleagues, which I find in interesting. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if that is actually part of, of three. Um, and I wonder if the AIA is just a result of, of the way the code kind of, kind of started. George, do you know if they have a hierarchy on theirs as well? Uh, I do not. Okay. Because yeah, I, I, I find it interesting, number two is to the client. Yeah. Number one is to the public. Right. Um, and the NSPE has um, s similar code of, code of ethics. Um, and I want to focus on uh, uh, number two, number three, and number five here. When a design professional meets with an owner to try to get work from that owner, and that professional claims expertise that he or she does not have, I think we would clearly agree that that is not ethical. That violates pretty much all of these. Uh, we try not to do that. We don't market ourselves as an architect who can design a 50-story building when all we've designed is wood frame, right? What about a product rep who is meeting with an owner or an architect, and that product rep misrepresents performance tests for his or her product? What about a construction manager who is meeting with an owner and produces an unachievable construction schedule just because the owner expects the building to be built fast. All three of these probably we would all say are not ethical. But here's the thing. The architect can be censured and you know, the can lose his or her license. The product rep, what's the punishment for doing it? Product reps out there? You don't get the next job, right? You don't get future work. So there's not that sort of code-based legal punishment. It's a market-based punishment when that, when that happens. 
Um, now comes the hard part. The local paint store. This is based on a true story of an architect that I know quite well. The Pig Snoot School Board, a small town in the mythical state of Missouri, is building a K-12 school. And I want to ask you whether this is ethical or not ethical. The architect and specifier gets this requirement. Everything else is bid, but the paint spec is sole source using Billy Bob's paint store on the main square in Pigsby. And Billy Bob is the brother-in-law of the superintendent of schools. Anyone think this is ethical? No. Yeah. no well, okay, we'll, we'll get to that. You're, you're smarter than, than I, I look. No. <laughs> <That's just scary. laughs> <It is scary. laughs> okay, so what bothers you about this? Why, why was this hard for us to say, yeah, we can do this? Well, self-dealing. I mean, there may be kickbacks. There may be all sorts of things going on. We don't know. Uh, was it com competitively bid? We don't know that. And most importantly, you know, the pig snoot public pays taxes. You don't want to waste, you know, their, their money. Uh, and so what are we looking at? What are the ethical duties of the board and the superintendent that they, they hire? And I actually asked this down in Springfield. Um, I probably would, should have put this in a little bit different order because I don't agree with the order here, but I think they were pretty much on point. Stewardship of public funds, probably the big thing. Welfare, probably the students first, and then the teachers, and then the uh, employees. And welfare being uh, what you teach the students as well as them just being help, healthy. And then the maintenance of your uh, bu buildings and your books uh, and so, so forth. So um, these are the sort of things that we're thinking about. And let me give you some other facts because Charles is going to beat me to it if not. Um, <clears throat> What if every five years they have a competitive bid for a five-year contract to supply paint? And they bid it to Billy Bob and the three big guys. And Billy Bob always wins because he's local. He's got the inside edge. So it's a com competitive bid, and Billy Bob has a five-year co contract. In Pig Snoot, everyone knows everyone else. So the idea that Billy Bob is related to the superintendent is known. But just to make sure, when they, they do the contract every five years, they reveal that that's going on. And here's the big thing. As we all know, well, we may not because this is hypothetical, but Big Snoot is miles from the big cities in the Smithville state. Billy Bob can get a phone call at 4 o'clock on a Friday, throw a bucket of paint in the back of his pick -em up truck, drop it off at the school Monday morning and they can start work. Nobody else can do that kind of service at the price that Billy Bob can, can do. So what about now? Who thinks that this is ethical now? Yeah, yeah, not as many as I thought. Why, why would it not be? What, what still bothers you? The fact that Billy Bob is related You can, you can schedule your maintenance. Mm -hmm. So the back the pickup truck argument doesn't cut it for me. Um, but you're still getting a better price from, from Billy Bob. You don't know that. Yeah, you don't know that. They, they bid it every five years. Yeah, he's already got a contract to supply pain. He's going to find that contract. It's, 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 it's reasonable whether he's related to anybody or not. And it's been disclosed to the public. It's been disclosed to the public. Right. And it sort of depends on what did that contract say. Does right. it say paint for maintenance or paint for the existing building? Is it really within the contract to apply it to a new construction? So our... You, get really, you, you, you need a lot more detail to make right. a real decision. So our, our hypothetical spec record who was faced with this uh, decided that they had met the requirements for being, being ethical. Um, and I discussed this with... Uh, our friend Laura, Laura Jean when we were up in, up in Duluth 
and there may have been scotch and gin that, uh, involved, I'm not sure, but, uh, local. but, yeah, Lord, he, local, oh. scotch and gin, or was it from out of town? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't remember. It was local. Yeah. Was it local? <laughs> yeah. At, at any rate, I, I, I never could get her in that conversation to, to say yes. She got real close, but she said, I don't know, it still kind of smells. And here's the thing, if, if you feel like that, that's okay, because a lot of corporations will have that law written. A lot of school boards will have that law written. Don't deal with family. There are corporations that if a, a couple is dating and they get married, one of that married couple has to leave and go some, somewhere else. So there are, there are rules like, like this. Um, what this is, really illustrates is deontology versus consequentialism. The deontology of these rules, right, you should not deal with family, is overridden, at least in, in my case, by the fact that <clears throat> the school board and the school district is getting a better deal. It's working out better for, for them, okay? That's the sort of balance that we have to uh, do. And uh, I concluded with Laura Jean with this story that, you know, okay, so you accept the fact that this is, okay, this is ethical. The proof of the pudding is when Billy Bob gets in a horrible divorce with the superintendent's sister, that next contract, <laughs> does he get? Because he should, right? If it's ethical, it's not based on them being brother-in-law, uh, you know, related. So if it's ethical while he's married, it should be ethical afterwards. As long as he's a little bitter. As long as he's a little, a little bitter. So yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, uh, Michael, there's there's a lot to think about and, and a lot to sort through. And you know, this is typical of many things that we deal with. Well, the other way you can look at it is the, it was a board requirement, and it's the board's fiduciary duty to, you know, to or an ethical duty to right. to be upfront with the right citizens of the city or whatever. And the the other thing that we didn't didn't get, get into here that's probably important is that the board hires the superintendent. The superintendent is an employee of the school board. So that adds a twist to it. Um, let's take a look at Zaha Hadid, uh, award-winning architect, fe feminist icon, um, sadly passed away a, a few years back. Um, Shortly before she, she died, she won the um, com commission for a football, and I say that in the soccer fans' um, language, the football stadium for the FIFA World Cup in Qatar in 2022. And she was interviewed by the Guardian newspaper, who was talking about this uh, award she had gotten, and they asked her if she, spent, if she felt any responsibility for the slave labor that was going to certainly build this stadium and for the tens or hundreds or thousands of workers who would die building it. And she was taken off, off guard and her response was, it's for the government to take care of. I can't do anything about it because I have no power to do anything about it. I have nothing to do with the workers. I am more concerned about the deaths in my own country, Iraq, so what can I do about that? It's not my duty as an architect to be concerned about the welfare of the workers on this project. How do y'all feel about that? Any, anyone support that statement? I see some cringes. Okay, and, and I, I can support it too. I mean, I've, I've taught CDP classes and CCS, and you know, I'm, a, I'm an architect. And what do we preach, right? Stay in your lane. The architect is not responsible for the methods and means of construction, not responsible for decisions that the owner makes, right? So I could say from a deontological standpoint, she's spot on here. But is every subject's soul his or her own? At what point does your personal ethics and morals override your duty? Let's look at something uh, from a few years back. This was fairly recent. 
we have a young architect who um, has just gotten his license. He's starting his career as a young family. And he's in a period of economic trouble. Inflation's running rampant. There's not a lot of work out there. And he gets this opportunity to work for a new government that's going to do a tremendous amount of building, more building than this country has ever seen. And this government is going to put them back on sound economic foot. This young man is 27 years old. Everybody's been 27. A lot of you are architects at 27. We jump at this, right? Uh, Albert Speer caught the attention of Hitler and soon became his first, not in terms of time frame, but in terms of the number one guy, his first architect. He designed a new capital city, stadiums, massive public projects. Ultimately, towards the end of the Second World War, he became in charge of the logistics for all war material and production. Speer was uh, one of the people that was tried at Nuremberg in the first trials. And uh, he, was, he had a lot of candor about what his role was. Here's a quote about him and how he presented himself. He posed as an efficient and helpful technocrat, willing to give detailed information quite voluntarily. Speer also professed to have no knowledge of the concentration camps and the slave labor camps. He said he was at the famous 1930s Nuremberg speech where, um, where Go Goebbels talked about the final solution, and he said, I left before that had happened. So he, um, he put himself in the spot of not really knowing. And his quote is, it is not individual mistakes, grave as they may be, burden my conscience, meaning I don't have these horrible um, crimes of killing people and designing death camps, but it's because I acted in leadership that you should punish me. He says, I take responsibility for being part of leadership, but I didn't do any of the real nasty stuff. And he was uh, acquitted. He got a 20-year sentence. He had the opportunity to write books. He uh, further kind of made himself into this role. In fact, if you uh, Google the good Nazi, his name will probably come up. Um, when he passed away, uh, other work was done in his life, and it's pretty clear now that he did know he, he, he was part of it and um, that uh, he was basically saving his own, his own skin. Um, but where did he cross the ethical line? Where did Schreyer take the step too far? When should he have backed out? When he first met, met Hitler? I mean, we, we want to say that, you know, this is Adolf Hitler, back off, right? But that's consequentialism looking backward at history. In the early 1930s, Germany was in horrible shape. Mies, Gropius, all the great German architects you can think of, of the Bauhaus and modernism, they all wanted Hitler's work. And here's alternative hit history. Think about if Mies had, had won what we think about modernism now, right? If he had been the one to do all the stuff that Schreyer did. So, um, So it's obviously our duty to speak out against horror like this. I think there's no question. Um, it, how difficult do you think it would have been for a person like Schreyer to speak out against Hitler even from day, day one? It's something that probably couldn't have been done. Or even to walk away. Or even to walk away, even to go some, somewhere else. So when we, when we look at um, the issues that confront us now, uh, the, the se sexual uh, abuse, uh, uh, stuff like that. You know, we just had a famous architect who has left his firm because of that. Um, we have to ask ourselves um, <clears throat> how we speak out. And if only we had a 67-year-old retired architect, you know, white guy who had a career, 
who could uh, enlighten us on this, we would have him speak. But since we don't, I'll be hypothetical and say that um, this has been going on for the last 40 years and maybe longer. Um, I'll also say that it's a lot easier for a 60-something year old man who went to college with the head of the firm who was uh, doing bad things to speak out than it would be for a 25 year old at the beginning of his career. Um, but I will tell you this, we have an ethical duty. Deontology requires us to speak out. Consequentialism requires us to speak out because by doing so, it's going to make a better world for all of us. And virtue ethics probably does also. If we're the right kind of people, we should do that. So now that I've cheered everyone up, we'll go on to the case study. I need a cup of coffee. <laughs> well, you didn't think this was going to be so Ethics is, is hard. This is a case study, and it does have kind of a happy ending. So uh, let me go through this, and uh, hopefully we can get out of here on time. City Corp was a big deal um, shortly after I got out of, out of school. This was, uh, this was built in the mid-70s. It marked the restart of a major building in uh, midtown Man Manhattan. Uh, it was a significant architectural and structural job. Um, one of the things that I have to point it out here, uh, there was a church that owned this land, and you can kind of see it like right here, right? Uh, they owned the ground. They said, City Corp, we'll sell it to you, but you have to build us a new church on the site of our old one. Right. So this resulted in a very odd plan. The main columns, those big black squares there, were at the center of the sides of the buildings, not at the corners as you typically would see. And the, the red dotted line is actually the footprint of the, of the building as it goes, goes up. Uh, and the church is, uh, I can't see it here, which it's in one, one of those corners. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, right. So um, that's, that's the basic plan. It was very in, innovative. Um, essentially what they did is they did these concealed large chevron beams every eight floors that took the load from the outside corners to the central columns. Um, and you can see them kind of under construction there. In addition, this had a tuned mass damper. It was the first use of a giant weight on oil hooked up to a computer that would read when the winds shifted and it would move this weight to kind of make uh, it stand up better in the, in the wind. So the building gets built, it's a su success story, it's a, it's a big deal in the early 70s. A year after it's built, a Princeton undergrad, Diane Hartman, has a class project. And the professor says, well, find a recent building and do the stru structural counts on it. So she chooses City Corp, and she, um, her cal calculations show that quartering winds govern. Now, typically in a, a square building with columns on the corner, you only um, look at the end look because that's going to be the main case. But because of where the, the columns are here, this quarter, this 45 degree wind uh, is really, uh, you know, the worst thing. So she, she's about ready to turn this in. She says, this can't be true. This building was designed by a structural god. William LeMessure, who really, literally was the, the top of the line at that time. And she calls him up. And she says, hey, I did this. My calculations show that, that uh, the quartering winds are the worst. And being who he is, he says nonsense and hangs up the phone. And then he gets to thinking. So he gets all of the calculations and all the plans. And he spends the weekend in his place out in the woods in, in Maine going over everything. And sure enough, she was right. Quartering winds were the governing thing. So um, he did the calculations again using the quartering winds. He found that it could withstand hurricane winds of a 55-year storm. But he also had some change orders. 
and someone in his office had approved using bolted connections for the main wind braces instead of full pe penetration welds. Now, anyone who's been around construction knows how difficult it is to do a full penetration weld on a job site. Both the connections were far easier. They were also far less strong. And that brought the, the uh, windstorm down to a 10-year storm. But if the mass damper would operate, it would be a little bit better. So here he's faced with this masterpiece building that in a reasonable hurricane coming through New York City could topple over. He runs more wind tunnel testing with the new, new calyx. He develops a plan to fix it. And basically what he did was uh, come up with a, a steel plate that could be welded over the bolts. And because the, the, uh, the wind bracing was on the inside and not the outside, you could do this from, from the inside and get it done pretty, pretty quick, quickly. So he notified the architect, his attorney, and his uh, insurance carrier, probably not in that order, I would think. <laughs> uh, he hired a consultant who had greater expertise in the problem, and he met, once all, all this was done, because he wanted to have a plan for how to fix it, he met, met with the building owner and he said, oh, by the way, City Park, there's a, a chance your building might fall over with a big windstorm. So when the owner, we presume, picked himself up off the floor, the first thing they did was put together a team with a contractor and folks from inside their, their group uh, for how to get this done, where to find all the, the stuff or put a, a work plan uh, you know, uh, in, in place for it. They notified the building de department and they got the, de the building department to swear that they wouldn't tell anyone. This was all kind of done behind the scenes. They formulated an evacuation plan. Well, the way they did it was they went to the Red Cross and got the Red Cross to do a survey of how many people were in the adjoining buildings and to formulate the plan without really telling them why they needed it. Uh, they issued a press release of six or seven things, and at the very bottom it was, uh, we have some work that we need to uh, do. The code has changed. Uh, uh, the bank is in no danger, and this is a conservative approach, so we're going to kind of upgrade a bit, but don't worry, you know. The work proceeded in relative secrecy. Um, what they did was they would go in after the office workers left, rip the drywall out, weld the plate on, put the drywall back, and paint it, and be done by the time the workers came, came in. And they proceeded floor by floor, and in eight weeks, it was done. We don't have anyone real young here, so I don't really have to tell you that newspapers used to be a big deal, and the New York Times, <laughs> failing now, used to be a big, big deal. Le, Le Measure gets a phone call from his secretary who says, oh, so-and-so, a uh, reporter from the New York Times wants to meet with you on Monday. There's a newspaper strike that lasts the entire time the work is going on. So he never had to meet with the New York Times. A lot of things came into play here. His ethical actions, he knew right away to take action, even though it would cost him financially, cost his reputation as being the top guy in what he did. Uh, it could have even be bankruptcy for him. The repairs were done within eight weeks. The PR handling, by keeping it secret, minimized public panic. And he's usually hailed as a textbook example of good civil engineering ethics. But questions and second guessing is still there. Was the secrecy and the hiding of the information appropriate? Could this eight week time frame have been reduced to three weeks if they worked round the clock? Uh, and was it really about minimizing public panic? Or was it that City Corp didn't want to be sued by its neighbors because they were possibly having to shut down while this work was going on? 
and does what happened in September of 2001 color our view? Are we looking at consequentialism backwards, right? This was before the World Trade Center. Does the fact that we have seared in our brains the images of those buildings coming down color the way that we would act if we were faced with a similar thing now? So what's going on with the building that she's leaning? The residential building that's that's so yeah. Yeah. Brock, Brock Howard said said this all the time. So we'll we'll talk about that afterwards, but let me let me leave you crying in the aisles or laughing hysterically like I promised. Well, I want to know what happened to the guy that approved the change order. <laughs> 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 I don't yeah. know if they hired the graduate. Um so anyway, let me let me wrap wrap up with this. Um this fellow Kramer actually uh in uh, if you download what I put on the on the website, it, it has all the all the re references. But he makes makes these points. C City Corp should have been checked for quartering winds because building codes require consideration of the most severe loading case. Do we as professionals have an ethical obligation when a design gets out of the ordinary to spend extra time on it? And if we do, do our owners have an obligation to pay our fees? Um, the decision to change below the joints to bolted joints was an important change that should have been considered more carefully and answered the question of what happened to that guy, I don't know. But what should have happened is someone senior should have been overseeing his work, right? The measure had a duty to publicize the problem with, with, the, with the building by his, his code here. Deontology versus consequentialism. Where decisions based on professional duty are on achieving the best outcome. So this is an ethical story with a happy ending. The building didn't fall. Everybody's happy. Uh, life goes on. The question I would ask at the end of this is, can we really use this as an example to learn from? And if we do learn from it, do we take it step by step and word by word, or do we reconsider some things that were that were done? So even in, in the best case, even in an uh, example that's held up to a high standard, there are things that you can look at and second guess and, and think about where it was done. Okay. Ready to laugh and cry, Ron? I'm, I'm expecting you to be different. <laughs> Ethics has been around for a long time. Ethics has been a continual thread in the tapestry of human philosophical thought. The spec writer did, did not write that. You know, some, somebody else did, I'm sure. Ethics spring from, but are separate from, personal moral or re religious codes, legal or po political duties, uh, and politeness or custom. And most importantly, ethics allow our profession regardless of who we are or what we do to, to function. They demand a fundamental fairness, mutual trust and reliance, and they demand us to uh, provide safeguards for the public. When I told some people that I was going to be doing this, and I would tell an architect, he'd say, oh, there won't be any contractors there. Those guys are, are horrible. And the owner would say, well, you're not going to have many architects. But I, I, I think we have this. Um, cynical view of other people in the business. And for ethics to work, we really need to have a fundamental trust. That's what the basis is in all of our contracts and, and how, we, how we deal with things. Ethics is not easy. Um, but fortunately, most of the time, it shouldn't be a problem because we have a lot of things going for us in making good choices. We are all moral people. People without ethics don't come to things like this. You know, unless you're here to try to figure out how not to be ethical, but I don't think that's the case, right? You have a fundamental understanding of good and, and right. And keep in mind, it's not about just being a good person. You remember the Greeks said about uh, flourishing over a lifetime of knowledge, experience, and habit. The more you practice good ethics, the more ethical you will be. You have duties, you have codes of professional ethics, you have laws, 
You have uh, your employer that provides a foundation for ethical actions. But remember that deontology is not just the written codes. Deontology demands we have a soundly reasoned basis for our duty. Written codes of ethics always contain the bias of the writer. Your obligation to the public override business or monetary gains. Consequentialism means that you're looking at the end result. But here's the thing, the more knowledge we have, the better we are at consequentialism. The more we know about what's going to happen, the better we are. It's the unknown future that makes consequentialism hard. So um, I hope this presentation has given you a better understanding of the foundations of ethics so that when you're faced with ethical choices that are impossibly hard, um, you can make the right choice. And if you can't make the right choice, at least make a good choice. And that's all I have, and I'll open this up to questions. I see a stun on you, too. <laughs> Peter. Uh, from the 1950s playground, you did not, you did not know about the uh, American code. But, but we did know that nobody talked everybody wrong. Yeah. It, it, I, I don't know if there's a, you know, direct uh, from the, the wars of, of Naples to your school playground, but it's, it's certainly the same thing. There's no question about that. Other questions? You guys just being thoughtful. I, I think architecture is fraught with these ethical problems. Mm -hmm. uh, clients will challenge me to do things that are, are dangerous. And I said, well, and this is when I'm really happy to have a building code because I can blame it all on the building code or blame it on these horrible uh, municipal uh, plan reviewers, nasty people. And I'm really thankful they're there because it takes a real load off trying to defend a good, a good answer, right? Sure. Um, but, but there are other things too. So you spend, uh, what, six years in college and you spend thousands of hours between um, not just architectural subjects but also um, everything from, um, from physics to uh, psychology to figure out how to design buildings for people so you can serve them the best that you can with uh, an education and knowledge that you derive. You committed your career to serving people to design buildings that are safe and function well and satisfy their needs and their desires. And then steps in a contractor wants to be the middleman and be the design builder in this. And you say, how in the world can this be ethical at all? We're talking about a person has no knowledge about working with clients in design, has no idea what design is, and can't uphold any of this knowledge or basis for what you're doing at all. And, and there you are, design build, one of the most unethical practices uh, and actually, when you go back to the AIA Code of Ethics, um, they might help me out with this. Uh, design bill was pro prohibited for architects for many years, right? It was only recently that um, that, that was changed. I'd say maybe 20, 30, 30 years. So yeah, you know, it is uh, a problem. But I, I would say this about, you know, the building code being your friend. Um, your AIA code of ethics is also your friend because it doesn't require you to do an illegal action on behalf of your owner. What is the code of ethics for the um, I don't have the specifics of that. Uh, I suspect that it's probably one of those codes that's kind of a feel-good thing, this is how we should do things. I don't know that there's any teeth in it necessarily. Why do you think there, there's a difference between the engineer's code of ethics and the AIA code of ethics? Because we are licensed and they aren't, maybe. Would, would the licensing contractors with, with legal obligations fix that? What prevents, I mean, we have, we have a legal obligation and then we have our, our canon 
those are two sets of things. Right. Well, one is a profession, and the other one is not. So if you would ask a, a contractor, for instance, why are you in this building? Because you see fit to make it, and you do good stuff. You may even agree with them. Yes, you do good stuff, and you come in under budget, and, um, and you met the schedule, and you did a beautiful work, and, but, why do you keep, because I make money doing good stuff. Well, an architect would never answer that question this way. He would say, that's because you don't make money. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. He'd say, because I like representing a client doing their project. But that's, I it's think. It's a whole different answer. I, I think that's one of the fundamental di differences. In, in, and I kind of mentioned this a, a bit. How do we get punished as architects if we are unethical? We lose our, our license, we get kicked out of AIA, or whatever. If a contractor is unethical, how do they get punished? They get punished because they don't get more work, right? I mean, if, they, if they're unethical and they break the law, then there's legal things. But if they're within the law and they are unethical, word's going to get out and they're not going to be able to get another work. It's sort of a marketplace thing. Adam Smith, right? So the AIA when it, it gets right down to it, it's a trade association. Um, they have a code of ethics, and that's fine. I think it's, you know, it's, it's something that we should uh, uh, certainly consider. But if you're not a member of the AIA, you're a registered architect. That doesn't mean that you still, you, that you are not an, an ethical architect. Just put that out there. Um, and Kelly, I would um, challenge you a little bit on the uh, design build. I've worked for terrific design build firms and not so terrific design build firms. So it's, uh, it's very dependent on the person that you're dealing with. So, you know, the broad brush of, you know, it's a terrible thing. I, I, I challenge on that one. So, when it gets down to virtue ethics and, and uh, the duty bound and the, and the consequential ethics, they're all tied together. It's up to us to figure out what balance there is between the three of them for each situation. You know, and I think us just thinking about ethics as you go into different situations is going to do nothing but help you. You're going you're gonna to be guided by at least a, um, a conscious decision to act or not to act. And, and, you know, these questions that I put out here are not simple questions. Right. And probably some of them, the room is pretty divided on the way that you came, came down. Um, I don't know the answer to this aha, how, how to be question. I can see both sides of it. As horrible as that answer sounds, it's absolutely duty-based for what we do. Mm -hmm. We do that every day, right? So ultimately, it becomes a personal choice of do we take the job in the first place? And if we do take it and we find out something horrible about it, do we back out of it? Even in her case, she's not performing task any right. more than we are a contractor is hired by the owner to do a project that we're a part of. We have no clue what's happened to the tune because we don't contract or any subcontractors. We have no idea what technical situations are taking place there. Right. And in that case, I don't know why she would be responsible for that situation. Um, and every every situation is different. Right. Which is why you have multiple ways of looking at each situation. Right. Uh, I think that the the day-to-day -day actions of people make a big difference. I mean, when I think of the, the role of what the organization here finds us, it has to do with this specification. And I can't think of a part of the industry in construction that is more attempting to provide equity and fairness than a specification. If you took any section, the idea of how it's organized, where to find common information, how to use 
specific references to either quality standards or performance standards or warranties, saying specifically what is warranted and, and why it is, and with the expectation that aside from what building codes may say, um, specifier has the opportunity to provide information about what is a best practice because it brings value to a client. It may bring durability from the public standpoint, resiliency over time, less maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. And then giving those other parts of the construction industry the opportunity to understand uh, a basis of, on which they can make a proposal. And I guess, you know, I, I'm a practicing architect myself, but I think the idea here is that uh, with every action that we do, if we can create that, that sense, including all the things in Division One that say, when you make a submittal, you should do these things, it should contain this information, um, is the incentive for the other parts of our industry to provide the counterbalance and to say, hey, Fred, you know, we've moved on from that standard. This is the one we use today. It would be better if. On the other hand, he may withhold that and say, no, I'm not going to disclose that until I get the job. Well, I go back to sandbox rules. You know, it's like when I was three or four playing the sandbox, what would have been fair there? And the golden rule that you mentioned. But I think when it comes to that basis for how the industry functions, uh, uh, you know, well-written specifications that are clear. If you want to say in there, it's got to be by Jim's brother-in-law in your example about the school district, then you know what, everyone will make their own decision if they know that beforehand. Right. That shouldn't be discovered by that part of our industry right. after the same one gets the, the contract. The people who are bidding aren't fools. They will know after the first encounter not to make a proposal just because they know the outcome. So it has a self-fulfilling prophecy and those kinds of actions on the part of the school board or a vendor or a superintendent will follow them the rest of their career. Mm -hmm. That's too high a price to pay for certain members of our industry. So, you know, I think um, fundamental in, in specifications and CSI is that underlying premise of fairness and equity. Yeah, and that, that's, um, that's kind of what I was going for in the whole, the whole history thing is that that fundamental fairness has been with us for thousands and thousands of, of years. We, we really need to understand that what we do in this business is based on trust and fairness. It may not always work out, but uh, that's, that's uh, the way we need to start. A last comment. In 1904, there are drawings from one of the downtown buildings. The, the entire drawing set was 10 sheets. Mm -hmm. The entire specification was another three. It got a building done, no one was sued, no one was shot, no one was imprisoned, no, no one would die. It functioned for 110 years until we remodeled it. Yeah. Our, 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 our expectations have changed, but the underlying premise there of what the architect did, what the builder did, what the owner did, how you got paid, they weren't any, any, any uh, more clear uh, they were very clear, even in those days, but the expectation has evolved. And I think when we look at this, maybe expectations continue to evolve about other methods of delivery, other methods of design, expectations for practice, and so it's never a settled right. decision. I think that's right. And, you know, if you look at the current AIA uh, co code of ethics, they, they are pu pushing that, and, and it, it's certainly a, a good thing. The, the point that I was making is that that needs to be made in concert with the team. The owner needs to, to have buy-in buy on that and the contractor and everyone uh, involved with it. 
Yeah, you're right. We're we're in a a spot where we need to speak up. Good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I can't go out and make good choices. Thank you.